Well, hi, everyone. I am here live all by my lonesome today, which is kind of good for a change. I enjoy being with you guys. It's a little easier when I have a co-host, but with Facebook down yesterday, we weren't sure what was going to happen. So I see Liz, you hopped on a little bit earlier. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Anybody else here that you can let me know I'm live and Fliz, you're the only one who's here or Jay Liz, you could just say, hi, I'm live or we're live. We'll be good to go. Um, today, we're going to be talking about why winners use feedback as an important part of their growth. I think that's the topic. But hi, Carrie, good to see you. I'm glad we're live. And it's kind of getting dark here. So my camera may change <laughs> angles and lighting, but we're good. We're good. Yay. I see all of you coming. Enrica and Betsy and Sherilyn and Don. So good to see you. Thanks for coming. So today we're going to talk about winners and feedback, but we didn't do a Facebook Live on Monday, although I think my coaches sent out a video on the abuse cycle. But so we're here today to talk about the importance of feedback. We're here to talk about the understanding of the abuse cycle. One part of it is extremely important that you understand. And then we're going to in talk about all questions conquer. Like if you're not in conquer or you haven't joined conquer and you're sitting on the fence, like, should I join? Should I not join? We're closing our doors on Friday. And if you really want to see an amazing Facebook Live, you want to hang out with us on Friday from noon to three o'clock, we're going to be on here for three hours and we're going to have our Conquer sisters who feel brave enough to share their story, at least part of their story with you on our public Facebook page, what they've learned from Conquer, how they've grown from Conquer, what they've gotten out of Conquer. And so if you're thinking about joining Conquer and you're sitting on the fence, I highly encourage you to join now so that you can get involved in it, but come to the to the um, webinar, not the webinar, but to the uh, Facebook Live on Friday. It's going to be a three-hour live stream. I'm going to be on there. Some of my coaches are going to be on there, but probably most important, you're going to meet some Conquer sisters who've been in Conquer for a while, and they're going to share with you the value that they have gotten in being in Conquer. Conquer is our membership group. It lasts all year long. There's no start time. There's no end time. Well, the start time is always twice a year. So in um, October and May are always our start time. We only open Conquer twice a year. And then you can quit any time, but most people stay in it for at least a year, maybe two, um, just so that you can get all the value that you need out of it. Uh, so I'll answer questions about Conquer in a little bit, but if you're interested in checking out information about Conquer, it's right there on your feed. All right, so I'm gonna talk about my two favorite feedback uh, mechanisms. So feedback is something that gives you information about yourself because you can't see yourself all by yourself. You know that, right? In fact, I remember a couple of years ago, this is a really funny story. I was going to a place we call Spa Sisters. This is First Place for Health. A lot of you joined First Place for Health for diet and exercise reasons. But Carol Lewis, who was the originator of First Place for Health, invites a lot of speakers who are exhausted at the end of the year to a, a, a retreat, a one-week retreat in January down by... Um, her place in first place for health in Houston. And we go to a retreat center called Round Top. It's not fancy. It's not a spa spa. It's like a old ranch spa, but it's beautiful. It's We can walk. There's uh, cows with big old horns, those Texas longhorns out there. And we have some exercise and we have just prayer time. And it's just kind of time to recharge. But the very first thing that you have to do when you get it, you don't have to, but what the very first thing you do when you get there is they have a gigantic feedback mechanism. And that feedback mechanism is a scale. A scale in January. Can you imagine after Christmas? <laughs> and you have to step on that scale. Now, no one has to know what you weigh but you, but they're forcing you to face the truth like you gained 10 pounds over Christmas, all right? Because they want you to get healthy and do that quick. So you have to kind of see reality. And then the next day, they give you all kinds of blood work. And we've had so many of our spa sisters, people that you would know if I gave you their names who found out that they had health issues during this time, which sometimes you're just too busy to get yourself checked out. And so we all have our blood work done. This is a gift for from them to us to just make sure. So that blood work is a feedback mechanism, but this is a funny story. So we were there all week, people with me and Carol Kent and other well-known people. Uh, and we were leaving and it was our, our bus left to take us to the airport at seven o'clock in the morning. So we all had to get up like at five o'clock in the morning to pack and, you know, get ourselves ready to go to the airport. And that light, that night there was electricity storm. And so all the electricity was out. So when we woke up, we had no lights and 
all of our chargers were dead all night because there was no electricity all night. So all we had was whatever charge was left in our phone. And we had a little bit of a flashlight to be able to see where we were going. So we couldn't take a shower. We couldn't put our makeup on. We couldn't hardly even pack our clothes. We had to like use our flashlight to pack our clothes. And we all got in the bus. And when we got to the airport around seven o'clock in the morning, when the sun was coming up, we just howled at how funny we looked because we didn't have an important feedback mechanism which is one of my favorites. <laughs> it's, it's a mirror. And I also have a little light on, now it's not going to go on. It's one of these touchy lights, but there's a battery in here that if I press it, it usually goes on. But there's a light and a mirror and it's a magnifying mirror. So I can see up close everything that might be wrong with hairs coming out of my face or my nose or eyebrows that are out of place. And that gives me feedback, right? Because high performers, people who want to do their best, look their best, be their best, understand the importance of feedback. I don't know if you're a sports fan, but if you are, or if you're a musician, or you're any kind of achiever of anything in your life, even a writer, when I write my books, guess what? I get lots of feedback from my editor. Red ink is called. And if your ego is too fragile to handle that red ink, then you can't write a great book because you're never going to write a great book all by yourself. You're going to have a team of people around you who make that book better. Every book that you ever read, you see the acknowledgments. The back of the book says, hey, this person helped me. My editor helped me. They made this into a better book. You don't look great all by yourself. Your mirror gives you feedback in the morning. And if you didn't look at the mirror, you'd look like we did at the Spa Sisters when we got to the airport and our hair was all sticking up and one person had two different socks on, her shirt was on inside out because you couldn't see what you were doing. You couldn't see. You had no lights. You had no mirrors. You had no one another in because we couldn't see each other either until we got to the mirror. And as, as soon as we got to the airport, we all ran into the bathroom to try to self-correct with lights and mirrors what we couldn't see without lights and mirrors. And ladies, this isn't just about looking at your outward self. I mean, of course, I looked in the mirror before I came here. I didn't want to come if I, when I looked in the mirror this afternoon. So I got ready in the morning at nine o'clock in the morning and I didn't look in the mirror since four o'clock this afternoon when I came here. And guess what? Like I had like makeup on the bottom of my eyes. I had to brush my teeth. I had lunch in my teeth. You know, you have to kind of self-correct and the mirror gives you that feedback. But if you want to look your best on the inside and you want to do your best as a person, if you want to fully develop your abilities, whatever they are in music or in writing or in speaking or in athletics, you have to receive feedback. You must receive feedback. High performers love feedback. They look for the feedback. They invite feedback. Now, when you're in a destructive relationship, guess what? You are your husband's feedback meter, as he is yours. When you are in a healthy relationship with anybody, even a good girlfriend, wouldn't your best friend tell you, that's not the best outfit to wear. These aren't the right colors for you. They wouldn't just say you look wonderful. They would say to you, hey, you look much better in blue than you do in brown. And if your friend isn't willing to be honest with you, I just went to my hairdresser, I got a haircut. And I said to him, I'm up for a change. What do you think my hair would look like if I did? He goes, mm, I don't think it would look good. And I trust him to know better than me what my hair will do and what my hair won't do. Isn't it wonderful that we can invite people in our lives to give us feedback? So this is what happens when you're in a destructive marriage or when you're in a healthy person. You feel very threatened by feedback. You get, to, you get defensive when you hear feedback. Now, not everybody's feedback is wise, and not everybody's feedback is true. I've shared the story before here that when I wrote my first book, or at least my proposal for my first book, I got 12 letters back. Nine of them were rejection letters. Okay, so that was feedback that not your book isn't good enough, but we can't, you know, we're not publishing this kind of book. Some of it was good feedback. We loved what you had to say. You know, we wish we could publish it, but we don't have room or it's not our style of book. But one person gave me pretty negative feedback, like you don't know how to write. You should hire a ghostwriter kind of feedback. It was devastating to me. Had I not had the other eight that said, we like your book, or you know, it's a great idea, keep going, and three publishers who actually wanted my book, I might have been totally turned off to ever writing again. So be careful the feedback you invite. But when you're in a destructive marriage, this is what happens. You have married, if, if the marriage is imperfect, that's normal. But if it's destructive, you have married an immature person who is unwilling to hear feedback. Because in any relationship, you're going to say, ouch, don't, stop, 
I don't like that. That bothers me. You're giving them feedback on a social level of what works for you and what doesn't work for you, what you like, what you don't like. Even if someone is being intimate with you in marriage, you have to have the freedom to say, I like that. I don't like that. And if you can't give someone feedback because they're too fragile to hear it, then it's really hard for you to fix anything because you can't say anything. And then you start to shut down and they start to go blind. They think everything's fine, that there's nothing wrong with me, that I don't need to change. I don't need to grow. And that's just not true for any of us. High performers, even the best athletes. You don't think that Tom Brady, the, one of the greatest quarterbacks in the world, looks at the replay? You don't think at the last game that he played with the New England Patriots, he didn't look at the replay and see what he did right and what he did wrong? You don't think an athlete who's on the balance beam even though she's doing cartwheels and flips and all kinds of twirlies on that balance beam, that she doesn't look at that replay to see what she could have done better or why she fell off the balance beam. One of the things that we do in Conquer is we become truth tellers to one another, not in a na nasty, snarky, critical way. But sometimes we have lived in an environment where no one's willing to say, what does it look like for you to be your best self? What does it look like for you to walk in core strength? What does it look like when you just react to what your husband's doing? This week, I got a blog question. You know, I answer blogs every week. And this week, I, I answered it in a kind of a different way. So the, the questioner was saying, you know, my husband has overly attached to my daughters. Our marriage wasn't going well. And when they turned teenagers, he sort of showered all of his attention and affection on them. And, you know, hopefully it wasn't sexual, but they're emotionally attached in ways that he and I aren't anymore. And this has been years and years and years and years. And I'm a pretty lonely married woman now. What do I do? And the feedback I gave her is it's tempting to just put all that on him as he was wrong. And he was, he reacted to his unhappiness in the marriage by overly engaging emotionally with his daughters so that they're in a perhaps emotionally incestuous relationship. But why was she willing to let that happen? Why was she willing to be so silent? Why was she willing to just shut down and let that go on for years and years and years. So now she's lonely and she's not connected to her daughters or her husband. It's easy to blame other people. And there's some truth to that. But we also have to look at ourselves and we say, how do I need to grow? What do I need to learn? How do I mature through this? Even when it's not my fault. Even when it's not my fault. I've shared this before on different programs. I'm not sure whether it was this one or not, but you know, you know, my mom was abusive when I was a child. And one of the things that my mom did when I was about 10 years old is in a fit of anger, she, I don't know what she was doing. She was shaking me or pushing me or whatever, but she pushed me down and I broke my teeth. All right. So I broke my front teeth and she didn't have the money to get them fixed. And so we went to a, a dental school where dental students <laughs> worked on my 10 year old teeth, which they did not look pretty. I had two silver uh, stubs there. And then when they got a little bit more sophisticated, they cut out the front. So there were two silver stubs with cutouts so that your uh, half of your tooth shone through and then the putty on the bottom of it. It was gross. It was awful. It was very humiliating as a kid to have to walk around with these two silver teeth that were totally not pretty. But I've had to have my teeth fixed a number of times since I've been an adult. And actually, my teeth look pretty good at this point, not because my mother fixed them. She didn't repent at all. She never even apologized. She said it was my fault that I broke my teeth because I was a bad kid. But they're my teeth. And I had to take responsibility. I got feedback in the mirror. I don't like the way my teeth look. I now have to pay to go to the dentist. I now have to experience the pain. I now have to do this or I'm not going to get the kind of teeth I want. I'm not going to be able to smile fully like I'd like to because I don't feel self-conscious about my teeth, right? And so even when it was not your fault that you have certain damage to your personality or to your psyche or to your emotional life or to your relational life, you still may have to do the work to get it fixed. And that work involves feedback. The mirror telling me that my teeth don't look right. My friends telling me my teeth don't look right. My pictures telling me my teeth don't look right, right? You can see it. And when you're overreacting to things or you're underreacting to things like this woman in my blog, she didn't react to anything for all these years. And now she's flatlined and miserable. How is she going to take ownership of her life and begin to heal? She's got to do that work, even if it wasn't her fault. I had to do the work, even though it wasn't my fault. You still have to do the work. And conquer will enable you to do that work in a safe, structured environment where you can get feedback 
from our coaches, from one another, so that you can grow into all the person that God called you to be. So I just want you to know how important it is to have that safe community where you can share with one another. Right now, I'm in conversations with a Christian leader who said some not so good things uh, publicly about something that we totally disagreed about. And I've been in conversation with him, giving him feedback that I thought what he said was harmful to women, what he said was destructive. And thankfully, right now, he's in a listening mode. I don't know if he will continue to be or where we'll go with this. But if we don't have the freedom as believers, as human beings, to give each other feedback where we're going to listen, that's why this whistleblower for Facebook, obviously, she didn't have any place in her company to give feedback that was being heard. And now she has to go public with some pretty hard things about the company that they're doing that's wrong. But ideally in good relationships and good families and good churches, you don't have to be a whistleblower, you just talk and they listen. And when they don't listen, this is where you have to escalate just like Jesus says. So if your brother or sister sins against you, what do they say? You give them feedback. He's not telling you to do this with your enemy. He's not saying, go give your enemy feedback. He's saying your enemy is your enemy. They're not going to listen to you. Don't cast your pearls before swine. But if you're in a relationship with someone and they're your brother or sister, they're in a close relationship with you and they've done something to harm you, give them feedback. Ouch, don't, stop. I don't like this. When you said this, this really upset me. When you did this, this wasn't right. Give them feedback. And if they hear that feedback, you have won your brother or sister. You've repaired that relationship, which is a good thing for both of you. But if they refuse to listen, then you still escalate the matter. You don't just shut down. You escalate the matter, however that might be appropriate to your culture. For Jesus, it was to tell it to the elders. Sometimes you've done that. The elders don't do anything, so I get that. But if they still refuse to listen, bottom line is some people will refuse to hear your feedback. Jesus gave feedback to Judas. He refused to listen. Jesus gave feedback to Peter, and Peter did start to refuse to listen. Remember when Jesus gave feedback to Peter? He said, Peter, before the rooster crows three times tomorrow, you're going to betray me three times. Or before the rooster crows twice, you're going to betray me three times. And Peter says, who, me? Not me. I would never do that. I would even die for you. He couldn't hear that feedback. And then Peter fell flat on his face. He failed. And Jesus didn't say, told you so, Peter. He said, Peter. Feed my sheep. Come back. I can restore you. But you've got to own that you're not as strong as you thought you were. He had to receive the feedback, and he did. Judas didn't. In shame, he went to hang himself. In humility, Peter humbled himself and received the feedback. The Bible tells us that if a person does not receive the feedback, then the relationship changes. And sometimes as wives, we're told not to give our husband feedback, that somehow we're supposed to pretend like he's flawless, perfect, that his ego sometimes can't take it. Now, we have to be careful how we deliver it. That's our side of the street, all right? To shame someone, to humiliate someone, to degrade someone, to constantly criticize someone is not a good use of your tongue, and it's not a proper way to give feedback. But if you're giving someone constructive feedback and they refuse to hear it, Understand that affects the relationship. Hebrews 3.13 tells us, let us encourage one another, one another, the relationships. Let us encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. When you give your husband feedback, you are being his helpmate. When you tell him his zipper is down, you're not trying to shame him. You're trying to protect him from embarrassing himself in public. If I give you feedback or if someone gives you feedback, we're not trying to humiliate you. We're trying to say, hey, your best self isn't showing up right now. What do you need for help so that you can be your best self? When you're reacting in anger, spewing out retaliatory words towards your destructive husband, when you're cheating on him because he's cheating on you, girlfriend, that's not the way God wants you to handle yourself. But we all do that when we get hurt, don't we? We all are tempted to react and not respond when we get angry. I've done it plenty of times, believe me. And conquer will help you learn how to develop that internal core strength so that you are acting out of the person you want to be, not just from your emotional side, but from your values and your virtue side, so that you show up to be the person you're proud of and the person you always have to live with, even if you don't live with your destructive spouse any longer. Jesus says, if you've given someone feedback and they continue to refuse to listen and aren't willing to change their ways or repent, The relationship is different. Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector, which means 
You don't trust this person. You don't have close fellowship with this person. It doesn't mean you're mean to them. It doesn't mean you snark them out in bad comments. It means that the fellowship with this person is altered, even if they happen to be your mother, even if they happen to be your husband, even if they happen to be your brother or your sister. You don't trust them in the same way that you would if they heard your feedback. So somebody might not hear your feedback, friend, but I want you to hear people's feedback too. Not everybody, because there's snarky people out there who just say mean things. There's mean girls, just like there's mean boys. There's destructive women, just like there's destructive men. But in a multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. Wisdom. So seek feedback. Don't try to do this journey all by yourself. So if you're in a destructive marriage, you need help. You need support. You need wisdom and you need community. Conquer isn't the only place that you can get that, but it's one of the best places for Christian support, wisdom, and community that I know of. So I would invite you to ask questions about Conquer if you want to. I'd be happy to answer them. If you have questions about feedback and the importance of feedback or the abuse cycle, because it's so important when we talked about in the webinar, how do you know if he's really changing? I didn't really cover this in the abuse cycle. Same truth. It's just I didn't use that as an example. But the same truth is so often when we think about the abuse cycle as being a clock. OK, so it's a cycle goes round and round and round and cycle over and over. That's why we talk about the patterns. What are the patterns? Oh, he, he always cheats on me or he always lies on me or he always dismisses me or he always devalues me or whatever. So when he's on his good side, when he's on his good side, when he's being kind and sweet and loving and helping around the house and taking care of the kids and paying the bills, whatever, don't think for yourself that that means he's changed because the change doesn't come on the good side. He's always been partially good or you would have never married him. He's always got a good side. All men and women have a good side, whether it's coming out of their values and their virtues, they really want to be a good person, or it's coming out of the other place of manipulation. Like I can get what I want if I'm nice to you. I can get you to sleep with me tonight if I'm nice to you. If I do the dishes, you'll sleep with me tonight, right? Or you'll forgive me or you won't call the police if I'm nice to you, right? So it's still a controlling tactic. It's just the nice side of it. It's still the same cycle. So understand that when we're looking for change, we're not looking for it on this side of the cycle. We're looking for it on this side of the cycle. What's this side of the cycle? This side of the cycle is when he's upset, when he's emotionally mad at you, when he's disappointed in you, when he's frustrated, as all of us are. Every single human being who's married to anybody or single gets aggravated, frustrated, disappointed. That's just human life. When he's in that place and you're not giving him what he wants or he's not getting what he wants, how does he handle himself? If he handles himself with controlling abuse, whether it's covert or overt, you're still in the same cycle, right? But the change that you want to see is when the new history is, and we talked about that in the webinar, the new history is when he's in that place of <gasps> aggravation, disappointment, frustration, which may start triggering you into, uh-oh, old history, how does he handle himself? Is it new history? And he's calming himself down. He's getting a timeout. He's calling a trusted friend for feedback and help. Or is he still vomiting all over you or trying to control and manage you? If he's still doing that, it doesn't what happen, matter what's happening on the good side of the cycle. The cycle is still the cycle. It's still the destructive cycle. It's still the destructive pattern. So we want the changes to be seen as you're experiencing a little bit of old history, the buildup phase of his aggravation or emotional tension, not when everything's going well and he's nice, but when it's not going well and he's tempted to road rage or he's tempted to lie or he's tempted to cheat or he's tempted to go watch porn or he's tempted to hit you or he's tempted to spiritualize everything and scold you. Is there changes on that side? That's the side of the cycle that you must start to see genuine, heartfelt, consistent change to know that he's changing. So one way you test that is by saying no. When you're too nice and you give in all the time, then he's never frustrated. So I'm not saying purposely frustrated, but what I am saying is be honest. No, I'm not sure you can move home yet because I just don't trust you yet. Oh, come on. Come on. How are we going to know if we're ever going to get together? Now he's starting to control you. Now he's starting to pressure you. He's not really changing. If you were really changing, would say, that sucks. I'm really disappointed, but I understand. I understand that I don't deserve you to take me back right away. I'd like to come home because I miss everybody, but I get it. That's different, isn't it? When he accepts your no without accusation, without attack, without a blame, without a spiritualizing component to that. But he just doesn't like it, which is, I don't like your no either, but I accept it, right? And I don't blame you or attack you when you say no. 
All right. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say, but I want to open it up to questions. And I'm here to answer all your questions about what you heard at the webinar. If you didn't get those answered. Now, remember, this is my public Facebook page. This isn't the private webinar page. But if you had a question about a friend, so to speak, uh, about that or something that we're talking about, the importance of feedback in your life, not just your spouse's life, because if they were receiving feedback, you wouldn't be watching this. If your husband was receiving your feedback and adjusting his behavior, just like if he received your feedback and pulled up a zipper, you wouldn't be telling me about it, right? So when they're not, when someone's not accepting your feedback, understand that they're not open to your feedback. But we're not talking about him here. We're talking about you. Are you open to my feedback? That you cannot do this all by yourself. That you need support, you need wisdom, and you need community to help you move through this in a good way. Otherwise, you're going to just react. And then that may be just as destructive as what he's done. And your kids are watching. So you want to do your side of the street as cleanly and as maturely as you can. All right. And we have a prize for the person who's participating the most. I won't forget to do it. So Kim, please remind me halfway through this that I have to do that. How can I move on? I don't know what moving on looks like for you. So um, I don't know because I don't know what moving on looks like for you. So if you could be a little bit more specific and I'll see if I can see it in the feed, feed right now. But moving on from what? From the disappointment of him not willing to change? From re to rebuilding your life? What does moving on look like? I think this is so important. And, you know, many of you know my mom just died and my stepmom and my dad is struggling with moving on, you know, so this part of his life is over, married, he's 92 years old, and he doesn't have a whole lot to look forward to, he doesn't have a whole lot of energy to rebuild his life, but he still is moving on, he still has to, or he's just going to die too, right? And so even though we don't like reality, we don't like that our marriage has ended, we don't like that our husband doesn't want to change, we don't like that, you know, he doesn't like that his wife died, I get that you don't like reality sometimes. Reality is tough. Reality is hard. But healthy people accept reality and they move on. Not that they forget the past, but they accept what is and now they make adjustments. So if what is, is I lose my arm or my brother-in-law during all of this lost his finger in an accident. So he lost his finger. So now he doesn't have his finger. Well, of course, you grieve that for a season, but you have to move on. He's got to learn how to manage life with four fingers now instead of five. Now, that's not a huge adjustment. That wouldn't be the same as if he lost his arm, but he still has an adjustment to make, right? He's got to move on and accept that this is gone now, and he's got to manage life with nine fingers instead of 10. And that's an adjustment for anyone. So whatever adjustments that you have to make, the quicker you can accept what is, the quicker you can learn what you need to learn to manage what's next. When we live in resistance to what is, I can't believe this is happening to me. Why is this happening to me? This is so unfair. I can't take it. This shouldn't be happening. And we live in this resistance. We know what's happening to us. We're getting divorced or our husband's cheating on us or whatever it might be. And yet we're resisting accepting that knowledge. Even if I have breast cancer, or I have a lump in my breast. Once I accept I have a lump in my breast, then I'm going to make an appointment to check it out, right? If I'm not accepting that, and oh, it's, it's not that. I can't be that. I don't know why this is happening. I, and then I'm just arguing with reality. Now, I don't even know it's cancer, but I'm still arguing with reality, right? Once you accept reality, I, I've got some health issues. I've got to go take care of that. I've got to find out what that is. And then you find out it's more serious than you thought it was. You've got to accept reality. You can't move on until you accept where you are. Just let me give you one more example. Let's say you're lost. Let's say you're lost. You're really lost. Leanne, one of our coaches, my co one of our, our coaches on our team, you've met her before. She and I were on a hike last year. And we went to a new place. Stupid. We, we, we were stupid. We didn't tell anyone where we were going. We just said, oh, let's go to a new hike. We were in the car. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Let's, oh, well, let's go here. We never called our spouses and said where we were going. We went to a hike about 45 minutes away. We both had our cell phones. She said, oh, my cell phone's almost out of charge. I said, no worries. I've got full charge. Now we use the go, you know, all trails maps to kind of see where we're going on our hike in the mountains. So when we get on the hike, you know, we're about 45 minutes in. It's a five mile hike. We're in a new place. We've never been there before. We have no maps. We're just using our map on our cell phone. Leanne goes, oh, my cell phone died. No problem. I can get my cell phone up. I pull my cell phone up. Leanne, my cell phone's not working. What's going on? 
Verizon works in Arizona, but AT&T does not work in some places of Arizona. My maps would not come out. So now we're lost. We are totally lost. We're on a mountain we've never been on before. It's very scary for that to happen because you don't know where you are and you don't know how to get out of there. And it's pretty darn big and it can be hot and it can be scary if it gets dark. And so once you accept you're lost, then you can make some plans to figure out what you're going to do. But if you don't accept you're lost, you can't even find your way out. And even then, sometimes it's a trial and a very stressful thing. And it was stressful for us to figure out and trust God that we were going to find our way out. And, and we did. But I think we could have panicked. You could panic and fall apart and become emotionally unglued. Or you can be in denial and just not accept it and wander and wander and wander and wander and think you're getting out and you're not getting out. And so it's so important for us to accept what is, even if we don't like what is, so that we can take the next right step forward. All right, so let me answer some questions. Moving on for me means uh, moving on for me, him leaving me. Okay, so you have to accept it. He's left you. Here's where it gets tricky. Okay, and we talk a lot about this in Conquer. So if this is a problem for some of you, you really want to think about joining Conquer. How to join Conquer? It's on the feed right now. But if you're listening and you're not watching this, if you're listening on your phone or whatever, it's lesliefernick.com forward slash join Conquer. Conquer is a low cost membership program. It's open all year long. Once you join, you never have to quit. It's $37 a month, but you can quit anytime. If you're all in, you save some money by joining for a year. And Conquer takes about a year at least to get your feet into the ground to really begin to walk your Conquer steps out. But you don't have to. If you go in and you look around and you say, eh, this isn't really for me, you can just quit. It's not a big deal. It's worth trying. It's worth trying for you to get the help you need. So when someone leaves you, it's really painful. It's really painful. It's a ripping apart. It's probably not anything you wanted. But here's where you have to be really careful. We've talked about your internal story and your external story. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago in the Facebook Live. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. I did it. So I taught it. It was on a Monday about a week and a half ago. What's the difference between your internal story and your external story? So your external story is he left me. Those are the facts. My external story is I'm lost. My cell phone doesn't work. <laughs> right? That's the external story. The internal story makes all the difference. So if my internal story about I'm lost is, oh my gosh, we're going to die. How stupid were we? Leanne, it's all your fault. You should have charged your phone. I can't believe it's all my fault. I should have realized it. You know, we could have gone into all of that story. We didn't. We could have. So the story that you could go into, the story outside is he's left me. The internal story, you got to be careful of. What's wrong with me? Why am I so unlovable? What did I do wrong? I'll never be loved again. I'm so lonely, I can't make it. I'll never be able to live without him. Those are all your internal stories that you're telling yourself about the external story. When you tell yourself all those things, some of them may be a little true, like I'll miss him maybe, but maybe a lot of it isn't true. Maybe a lot of it isn't true. And you're going to have to sort through, maybe not the external story, but the internal story. Because once you get clear on the internal story, maybe the internal story is, I wouldn't have chosen this, but maybe this is going to teach me what I need to learn to be more mature, to grow up. Joseph wouldn't have chosen his external story in the book of Genesis, but he was in charge of his internal story, as you are. And so I would be really cautious now and be very aware. And again, this is where feedback comes in. Twice a month, we do Conquer phone calls, and I interact with the women on Conquer, one of my coaches do via Zoom, and we talk about this internal story because sometimes we are absolutely powerless to change our external story. If my external story is my husband left me or my external story is I have breast cancer, I can make up a pretty scary internal story about that. That means I'm going to die. That means my kids are going to hate me for the rest of their life. That means my whole life is ruined. That means my kids' lives are all ruined. You don't know that. I grew up as a kid from a divorced home, and it wasn't healthy, and it was pretty dysfunctional. <laughs> right? And look what God has done. Look what God has done. Don't tell yourself all these scary stories that you don't know are true, but Satan will paralyze you with these beliefs that you believe without ever double-checking. And without ever listening or allowing people in your life to hear these crazy stories so someone can say, hey, girlfriend, I don't think that's true. 
So in our Conquer phone calls, we often talk about that. I'll say, hey, here's your external story, but the internal story, let's look at the lies you're believing. Let's look at some of the beliefs you have that are shaping the way that you're walking this story out. I'm unlovable. Nobody wants me. My whole life is ruined. My kids' lives is ruined. I'll never be able to make it. When you believe that, what kind of action steps do you think you're taking? Not very functional ones not very strategic ones, not very strong ones. And then when you don't take, so if, if I'm lost, that's my external story. And my internal story is, oh my gosh, I'm going to die here in the desert of thirst and I'm going to be freezing and some coyote is going to eat me tonight. And I just sit down on the ground and start crying. It's pretty likely that what I'm telling myself will come true, right? Because I'm not taking any strategic action on my own behalf because I'm believing I can't. Not because I'm lost, but because of my internal story that says, because I'm lost, I'm helpless. You are not helpless. You have a heavenly father who says, I will cause all things to work out for your good. So be not afraid. I am with you wherever you go. Whatever happens to you, I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be careful of the internal story you tell yourself about your external story. All right. Is conquer for new divorces? It could be depending on where you're at. So if you are struggling with this, if you need to reevaluate how you handled your side of the street and all of that, if you want to, if you want to just come in and blame him and be angry, probably conquer's not the place for you because we're going to give you feedback about that. We're going to say, hey, what's not what's your part of the divorce, but how are you going to take ownership of your life now? How are you going to rebuild your broken life? How are you going to move forward? What's your next right step? We're going to help you stay focused on your journey versus being angry at his decision or even your decision to get a divorce, right? So there's a grief that goes on. There's a loss that goes on. We will support that. But yes, it could be very appropriate for you depending on where you're at and why you're getting divorced. And, and it's very, very important. Sometimes we get people in Concord who have been married two or three or four times um, because they didn't do their work after their first divorce. They just thought, oh, it's all him. It's all him. And then they married another one just like him. And they, oh, it's all him. I got another one. I'm going to marry another guy. And they didn't do their own work. And part of our own work, and I'm just going to give you guys feedback. I don't know most of you, but part of our own work is to say, what is it about me that attracts toxic people? And it may not be your bad qualities, it may be some of your good qualities. It actually may be some of your best qualities. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying be careful because some of your best qualities, like I, I, my best friend from high school, she asked me this question because she was on her third marriage. And so we, we were talking about this one time after I hadn't seen her for years and years and years. And we were talking about this. And I said, well, tell me about how you made, met your you know, third husband. And so she told me. And, and it was a problem with she was too nice. She had no boundaries. She never said no. And so she couldn't discern because she was so nice and so accommodating and so forbearing and so accommodating to his needs and his wants and what he said he needed, because oftentimes good, sweet people are. She never had a sense that if she said no to him, he would turn into a different person. And so part of learning your part of this dance is to say, maybe I'm too accommodating and have no boundaries and I'm too giving and too forgiving and too loyal. And I don't know how to set boundaries with people. And I don't know how to set no, say no. And that's not a, a bad thing that I'm loyal and I'm forgiving and I'm forbearing and I'm long suffering. But I also need to learn some discernment and boundaries. And I'll learn those in conquer. I'll learn those in conquer. Okay. Um, how do we sign up? How much is, okay. Um, he left me blindsided. I need help. So you can sign up by going to lesliebernick.com forward slash join conquer. It's on the feed, right on the picture, right underneath my picture. But if you're just listening, it's lesliefernick.com forward slash join conquer. When you go there, you're not going to, you don't have to join right away. You're just going to read other people's stories about being in conquer. You're going to see a video from me. Uh, you're going to read some information. If you're sure you want to join, just go to the bottom and press the button and say join now. But if you want to learn more about conquer, then just learn about it and read the page and watch the video. There's a really good video in, in, in there. It's about 20 minutes long about fear. Like, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And it gives you four things that you can do to deal with fear. So I give you lots of stuff. But, but if you want to be a part of our community, if you want to connect with other women who are going through what you're going through, we just had um, a meeting with the women who have already signed up with Conquer so far. So um, today's Tuesday on Friday, we had a meeting with them. And we had about 150 women come into this meeting in a Zoom call. It was powerful. 
because here are these women and some of them didn't have their cameras on right away. And we broke up into small groups of three women and we gave them a very powerful question to ask each other. And at the end of that time, when they came back into the room, they were like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. This is the first time I told someone what was really going on and it felt so good. And I see all these other women and I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. It's not just me. That is powerful. When you align yourself with other godly women who are beautiful and intelligent and resourceful and competent and they're being rejected and they're being cheated on and they're being told you're a Jezebel spirit, all the things that you've heard and you see them and you go, oh my gosh, she's amazing. How could he treat her that way? You realize it's not about you. Some people have issues. My mother's treatment about me was not about me. I was just a kid. I wasn't a perfect kid for sure, but it wasn't about me. It was about her and her problems. And the way your husband treats you is not about you. Just like the way you treat your kids is not about your kids. If you beat your kids when they're spilling their milk, this isn't about your kids. Kids spill milk. That's what kids do. If you're flipping out because your kids are spilling your milk, this is about you. This is your work to do. Just like if your husband's flipping out because you don't do everything he wants. That's not your role. And yet he believes that you should be a perfect person, just like maybe you believe your kids should never spill their milk. You have these wrong thoughts that we talked about in the webinar that need to change just like your husbands do. But how he treats you has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with who he is. But I would say the same is true of you. How you treat someone has everything to do with who you are. And this is where the rub comes in because sometimes we're living out of our emotions and someone hurts us so badly that we feel justified in hurting them back. But if your husband used that excuse with me and said, well, my wife hurt my feelings because she wouldn't forgive me and let me come back into the bed. And so I slapped her. I would say, you have, that's not what you can do when you're hurt. That's not a healthy reaction to hurt is to hurt someone else. But hurt people hurt people, right? And so we're a mess in the society, even in the church. We're a mess of emotions and triggers and immature people. And I want to help you. And sometimes evil people. And sheep in wolf's clothing, or yeah, sheep's in wolf, wolf, oh no, wolves in sheep's clothing. I knew that didn't sound right. Um, and so I want to help you discern the difference and know how to honor yourself, steward yourself and protect yourself and your children, not in, you know, crazy ways, but in healthy ways, the ways that Jesus teaches us to do that. Jesus stewarded himself. He protected himself. And he tells you above all else, guard your heart, girlfriend, guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. So you're responsible for that. Nobody else is but you. All right. How do you keep momentum going in conversation with your spouse who tends to be non-communicative with their thoughts and feelings? So let me, I think one of the things is not shaming him for that. So, so vocabulary, especially feeling words, feeling vocabulary, being in touch with your feelings, all the things that maybe women are a little bit more uh, easy with. Um, don't come easy to some men, and especially if they grew up in a home where conversations like that didn't happen. So when you don't learn to have those kind of conversations when you're young and learn how to hold those conversations in a conversation, don't think he's going to learn to do that when he's married. So so there's five levels of conversations. So write, your, write this down because this is really important. There's a superficial level like, hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? All right, that's not terribly intimate, but most people learn how to do that. But it's superficial. It just feels very empty if that's all you and your girlfriend talk about. Hey, how's the weather? Good. How's the weather over by you? Good. Now, do we, now what do we talk about? All right, so the next level is the news. Oh, my gosh, did you hear what's happening on Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg? And do you know Gabby Bettino's possible abuser was spotted on uh, whatever the trail was, Appalachian Trail. So you're just giving, did you hear that the so-and-so's are getting divorced or what time are the kids getting picked up from soccer? You're just communicating information. Not personal, but it's more interesting than just the weather. Okay, so you've got superficial conversation. You've got news as conversation. The next level of conversation gets a little bit more vulnerable. You give your thoughts and opinions on things. So let's put yourself in a situation where you're at a ladies' Bible study and the teacher is saying something that you disagree with, right? And you raise your hand and say, excuse me, you know, I'm not sure that David and Bathsheba had an affair. Like I said once, I'm not sure they had an affair. I think he raped her. 
That's my opinion. Now, how does that go over? How does that go over? I'm saying, I'm not just giving the news. I'm saying, I think this. I think that I'd like to paint our bedroom walls purple. What do you think? All right, so I'm giving a little bit more of myself in a conversation more vulnerably. When someone shame, that's ridiculous, you're an idiot. When they shame you for what you think, whether it's publicly in Bible study, whether you're a pastor, you give some feedback to your pastor and you give him what you think about something and he tells you you're ridiculous and you're just a woman and you have no right to tell him anything anyway, or whatever, you start to shut down what you think. And so you don't talk about what you think. You don't even know what you think because nobody cares, right? So then news, superficial conversation, news, your thoughts. The next level is your feelings. I feel hurt. I feel like I need more. I'm lonely. How can you say that in a marriage if you can't even talk about the facts? If you can't even say what you say, think safely, then, or you never learned how in a family, if all they did was talk about the news and they talked about superficial stuff in a family, he's never learned to go deeper, all right? And then when you say, what's wrong with you? He's like frozen inside because he doesn't know because he's never been in an environment where people talked deeper, all right? So I'm just gonna give him the benefit of the doubt there. Maybe, maybe not, maybe he just doesn't want you to know. But so we've got superficial talk, we've got news, we've got thoughts, we've got feelings, and then we've got nakedness, like you know everything about me and I trust you and I feel safe with you. Like marriage is supposed to be, naked and unashamed, that I can tell you anything about anything and you might not like it or you might not approve of it, but you're not gonna mock me and you're not gonna reject me and you're not gonna make fun of me and you're not gonna humiliate me. I can trust you to do me good, not harm all the days of my life because I know you would never intentionally harm me. Now, that's, what you're longing for in marriage. And that's what God has wired us for. We want that kind of connection. So I would say this, if your husband doesn't know how to go deeper, I might say, I might start with the thoughts, not the feelings, because he might be able to communicate his thoughts. What's your opinion on this? And when you say, thank you for telling me, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. I don't know if I agree yet, but, but I really appreciate you telling me. If you can encourage that, maybe he will be more willing to tell you more what he thinks. If he shares a feeling like that hurts me when you talk about that that way, or that, that makes me feel mad okay, thank you for telling me that you're angry. I didn't realize that. Or I, that wouldn't make me angry. So I, I, it's hard for me to understand why you would be angry with that. But thank you for telling me. Instead of, I remember a man sharing his feelings once with his wife about how he felt when she did something. And in my counseling session, and she goes like this to him, oh, you should a baby. Well, you think he's going to tell her his feelings again? Never in a million years, right? When you humiliate someone by sharing their feelings, you're being ridiculous. You're being a baby. You're too sensitive. You're overreacting. Well, it shuts us down, right? Just like if you were going to get naked in front of someone and said, oh my gosh, what lumpy cellulite thighs you have. You're not taking off your clothes again, right? We're, we're fragile people. So be careful, ladies, in your feedback that it's not shaming and degrading. And when someone does that to you, it doesn't make conversation good. This person's question was, how do you keep the conversation going when he doesn't know how to do that? So I might say something like, hey, I heard this lady on this page talk about this. Would you be willing to watch this? And you could just turn this on and let him watch and say, what's your family? Did you guys ever go deep? Because it's hard for us to go deep. And he might not ever even know what that is because they never did that. Or if you notice at family gatherings, Thanksgiving is boring as can be because no one talks about anything but the football game or the weather. Well, then you know that this family is not learned and he's not learned and he has no idea how to do it. And men hate feeling incompetent. And so they just avoid it. But if he's a good man in every other area, he pays the bills, he's reliable, he's faithful, he's honest, he's got sexual integrity, he's kind to you, then, then this is where you have to kind of say, I don't get all 52 cards in the deck. Generally, there's no pattern of abuse. There's no pattern of indifference. There's no pattern of, you know, all of that. Is he a little bit stuck? But maybe through feedback, kind feedback, hey, I noticed when we were at your family's house that nobody ever talks about anything. Was that like for you when you were growing up? Didn't you ever have like arguments about different opinions or what people thought? No, we never did. Maybe they never did. Maybe that's why we never do. I'd like to do that. I wonder if we could start by just at dinner time, just everybody saying what they're grateful for today or what was one new thing they learned today. So keep it safe. But try to stimulate some of that going on on the dinner table and see if it, it can happen. Again, we can be our husband's greatest helper 
for him to mature as he can be for us, for us to mature when we see areas in our childhood that we didn't get enough of. I certainly didn't get a lot of stuff and my husband didn't either, but together we've been able to work on that through some rough spots, but, but work on that um, versus attack and accuse and blame and degrade our relationship. And those are things that are important for you to learn to do for any relationship, both your child, with your children, teaching your children, having conversations with your children that are deeper than just superficial ones. And these are the levels. All right. What's the longest time period you've known the destructive partner to play the part of the changed person and then still fall into the old patterns? I'd say about two years, but they don't, it's not like they're this great person and then two years later they fall into the old patterns, but there's this this, this decline. So there's this honeymoon phase and then there's not the resolve to stick with it. There's a disappointment that comes, there's aggravation that comes, there's discouragement that comes, there's Um, wrong beliefs that they never are accountable to anybody for continuing their work. Let me just say this. Personal work is a lifelong journey. It is not a, oh, I went to counseling for a year and now I'm all better. All right. Most of us may not need counseling to do our work. We can do our work through one anothering, through community and connection with authentic people who will help us do our work with small groups and genuine relationships. But sometimes we do get stuck or sometimes we fall back and relapse. And so I think it's really important that if you're, so here's what we talk about in Conquer, our big circle or our true self, the self that we want to really be. And so I'll just draw this out for you. And we talk, and this is, we learn this a lot in core when we talk about core. So, um, so we'll just put our true self. I'm going to, I'll put this up here for you. Can, okay. And thoughts and feelings. And I'm going to put this up now. Okay, so if we think about ourself as being this whole thing, okay, so this is where our internal story is, this whole big circle, and then the external story is out here, whatever it is, okay, so this is our, so our true self is the self that consists of our values, our virtues, so let's say that my true self is, I'm a believer, I'm a believer in Jesus, I'm a kind person. I'm a good mother. I'm a uh, loving friend. I'm an honest person. Okay. So that's my true self as I would identify it. Now, do I always think honest thoughts? No. Do I always have kind feelings? No. (laughs) Or I wouldn't be a sinner and I wouldn't be human. Right. So, so when I think untrue thoughts, can I recognize them as untrue? Like, I'm just too stupid to do this. I can't do this. This is too hard. This is, this is not for me. I'm not good at this. Now, there might be some truth to that, but do I have the ability to give myself feedback and reflect? And can I invite other people to look at my thoughts, right? In conversation, in community, in counseling, coaching, wherever I am. So I have myself and then myself has my thoughts. How many of you have had some really crazy thoughts and you're thinking to yourself, why am I thinking like this? Like, I don't want to live, or I just, I'd be better off dead. We have some crazy thoughts like this, or God isn't real, or God doesn't care. We have thoughts. Of course we do. We have to recognize those thoughts so they don't control us. We recognize that we have thoughts. We also have feelings. How many of you had, you have this value, I want to be a good mother. I want to love my children. How many of you always feel like loving your children, especially when they're bad or they're disappointing or they hurt your feelings or they're rebellious or they're drug addicted or they're whatever. You don't feel those feelings. Same with your husband, right? So so what we've done as a culture is we've forgotten this part of the self and we just kind of go on those two channels. And we've become a deformed person because when we act and react out of those two channels without paying attention to our virtues and our values, We make some pretty bad decisions, like yelling at our kids or using our kids because we feel like it because they're a brat. We tell ourselves they're a brat and we feel like it. And it might be true that they're being a brat in the moment. It might be true that we're feeling like it. But who makes the decision if we don't consult our values and our virtues? What kind of person do I want to be? How do I want to handle this? And so the question is, if we haven't developed this part of our our self, what are our values? And we just learn to control these two things a little bit better. When life gets hard out here and we don't have 
a growing sense of who we are and who we want to be, then we might have negative feelings and negative thoughts again. And we start reacting out of those things instead of controlling these things by our virtues, right? So when I'm tempted to steal or cheat or lie because I'm in a jam or I feel humiliated or I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to be you know, in trouble if I tell the truth here. Of course, we all get into those spots. So who decides what I'm going to behave when I feel like smacking my kid across the face because they're giving me a bad response and I feel angry and I feel hurt and I'm thinking this kid doesn't deserve all the good stuff I do for them. And I want to just whack them one. Do I do that? Or do I say that would not be in alignment with the person I want to be? So if we don't do that work and we do a lot of that work in Conquer and all the other groups that we do, the more coaching groups, the deeper groups, but we at least talk about this in Conquer so that you can kind of see how change occurs. And if you want to change where you have to gird up the virtue quality, Guard your heart above all else, because that's where you're going to make your decisions from, not your emotions. Your heart is not your emotions. Your heart is your essence, your motivator. And if your motivator is just your feelings, I walk five miles every single day. I shouldn't say that. 90% of the time, I walk five miles a day. Never do I feel like it. Never do I feel like, oh, I think I'll go out for a walk today. I feel so much like walking. I do it because this part of me says walking five miles a day is good for you. And guess what? When I do it, when I don't feel like it, <laughs> I just do it. I feel so good about it afterwards. I feel happy about myself and my body because I did what I knew was the right thing to do. And so we talk a lot about this process in Conquer. And if you're like, I never heard this before. And this is, this, I'm out of control because I'm just reacting. See, see when, this, when this part of life, I'll put excess here. When this part of life, external life is hard and you're just reacting to hard out of your thoughts and feelings, you can mess up a lot of your life, all right? Or when this part of, so, so if this is tempting, like say, let's say a coworker is tempting because they're paying a lot of attention to you and your feelings are very attracted to that. And your thoughts are, you know, my husband doesn't treat me right anyway. And I'm just so miserable. I might as well cheat and just have an affair and maybe he'll be the right one. And so you do that. And then how do you feel about yourself at the end of the day? If you're, if you're a person of faith, you don't feel good at all because your virtues and your values, you've just gone against. Or if your kid is really aggravating you out here and they've done some really hurtful things to you and you think, I'm not putting up with this. And you start saying horrible things to your child and you live out of your feelings of anger and rage. How do you feel about yourself as a mom? Not good. You see, our identity becomes more and more deformed the more we live out of our thoughts and feelings. And that's why it's so important that we recognize them. But going back to your destructive husband, if he's not doing his work and recognizing them, then he will just live out of his thoughts and feelings. And we've talked about the lies. I'm entitled to do as I want with no accountability. You owe me. You need to do what I say. All of those kind of things, which feeds that monster instead of slaying the monster, right? So those are the, that's the work we have to do. That's the work he has to do. You can't do his work. He can't do your work. You got to each do your own work. All right. Let's see. Can you elaborate more on the situation of emotional incest with daughters? and suggestions for recovery and operating in core. Well, again, so sometimes emotional incest happens on both sides. So a mom will turn to her son for emotional support when her husband doesn't give it to her. Um, he becomes, you know, the one she leans on emotionally, maybe even affectionately. I'm not saying sexually, but just getting her affection needs from him instead of her husband and vice versa. So a husband will lean on a daughter, little kids, big kids, their daughters as their confidant, their support person, their emotional barometer, someone who, you know, loves me unconditionally, instead of working on the marriage, they will create a bond with a child that is a op uh, not opposite, but alienating to the marriage. So I'll draw another picture for you. So ideally, so I'm going to put H for husband, W for wife, and I'm going to put a strong bond. So ideally, a husband and wife get married and they have a strong bond. And then they have kiddos. So let's say kiddo number one, kiddo number two. All right. And so we've got two kiddos. And each of those kiddos have a bond with the dad 
and a oops and a bond with the mom. All right. So what happens sometimes when this part of the relationship starts to get fractured, when the wife and the husband relationship gets fractured, and this starts to get shaky, a wife or a husband or a female or male, they may attach a stronger bond to the child. And it could be the same sex child, or it could be an opposite sex child. So we're just talking about the opposite sex. So, so a wife, you know, will, um, or a hurt wife will start attaching herself to her daughter or her son as emotional support and vice versa. And this bond gets weaker and this bond gets stronger, but not only does this bond get weaker, what also gets weaker is the, the child's bond with their parents. So if, her, if the husband is getting bonded to this child and this bond is breaking, this bond is also getting weaker, all right? So the wife's bond to her own child. And so this, this can cause parental alienation. And so it's very unhealthy because ideally the husband and wife are the family unit. The children are the secondary family unit because they go off and establish their own family unit. Right. And it was just so cute the other day. I can't remember where we were, but I think we were, I can't remember. I think we were in Orlando and Disney world. And there was this little girl sitting on a bench with her daddy and she was about two or three. And he was, and he was, you know, young man. And she said, well, daddy, I'm going to marry you when I grow up. And that's very common little children, you know? And so when a child begins to realize, well, that's not possible because he loves mommy as the mommy, not me. Right. Then they begin to diverge themselves of that energy and, love daddy for daddy and mommy for mommy and find someone like daddy to marry, right? That's the healthy developmental stages. But when a daddy begins to bond with a daughter in unhealthy ways, it doesn't mean the daughter thinks she's going to marry the daddy, but it, it means that there's an emotional closeness that is harder for her to break off and have her own partner and vice versa. So we see young men who are attached to their mothers and can't fully bond with their wives because they're still emotionally overly bonded with their moms, all right? So it's an unhealthy maturation stage for a child. So, but oftentimes in unhappy marriages or unhealthy marriages, one partner won't have an affair, but they will bond with the opposite sex child for that kind of support. And that hurts the relationship with the other parent as well as the marriage. And ultimately it hurts the parent-child bond because it's in an inappropriate closeness, which prohibits her or him from fully attaching to their marital partner. So it's unhealthy all around. And what do you do about it? Well, when you see it happening, so in the blog, she let this go for years and years and years. So her children, it started when they were 12. And now she said they're adults. So she's let this go for over 10 years where she just thought, well, I guess I just had to put up with it. Now, of course, she's angry because she's left out everything. It's daughters and their dad, right? And so I think it's partly for you to start speaking up and saying, hey, I, I, you know, something's wrong in our marriage and I'm, I'm willing to deal with it. I'm willing to work on it. But you're getting some emotional kudos from our child instead of working on it with me. And that's unhealthy for her. So that would be the first step. Now, for this other lady who went 10 years, it's, it's too late to start talking to him about that because he's already done that. It's damage is done. Right. So it's for her to say, what do I need to do to write the ship in my side of the street. She can't write the ship on their side of the street. That's their work to do now. Um, it's too late. When you start to see the ship turning, you can begin to give some feedback. But when it's already underwater, for you to stand as critic is, is a moot point when you've allowed it to happen or watched it happen for 10 years. Um, and so I think it's really important for you as a mom to realize that when you turn to your children for your emotional support, um, you're not helping them. And when a husband turns to his children for his emotional support, you're not helping them. Children need to believe that their parents are strong. And I'll just say this. If you are in a situation where you're not getting the support you need from your dad, from your husband, the place for you to go to get the emotional support is conquer, right? Not to your kids. So you go to other women, godly women who've been there, who have done that, who are there, who can give you that support. You know, we need support. We definitely need support. We're not made to do this journey ourselves, especially when it's tough. When you're in a crisis, when you're in a traumatic experience, whether it's a tornado or, you know, as a depression in the world or whatever it is, or a crisis in your marriage, you need support. We all do. And get your support, not from your kiddos, because you need to be supportive for them. You need to be strong enough and adult enough that they can trust you, that you're not going to sink and they're going to have to save you because that robs them of their childhood. So it's very important for you to get the support you need so that you can be the mom that you need to be to show up for them, especially if their dad's wake up. Okay. 
On the subject of feedback, is it appropriate or okay to tell your husband you see narcissistic tendencies in him or should you only say that came from a counselor? I wouldn't use that word. Most people don't like to be diagnosed. Um, and so what I would say is, um, what, what bothers you about his narcissistic tendencies? So I would say, I don't know if you realize this or not, but every time we have a conversation, you interrupt me because whatever you have to say is always more important than what I have to say. I don't like that. Or did you notice that when we're in the bedroom, it's always about your orgasm, but you don't take any time to care about how I feel sexually or whether I even enjoyed what happened. I don't like that. So you're not calling it narcissism, but it's describing selfish behavior in whatever way he displays that to you. So I would be really careful about diagnosing or labeling someone because most people don't receive that kind of feedback really well. All right. It's not your place to do that. The feedback that you want to give them is how it's impacting you. How does their behavior impact you? How does their selfishness impact you? And if you can be specific about that, um, you know, hey, when we go out, you're always walking 10 steps ahead of me. Like, I'm not even with you. I don't like that. So how does it impact you? What is the behavior specifically? That's what you want to get feedback on. <clears throat> Please comment on how many women get help dealing with dysfunctional parent relationship. Well, you just go for counseling or you go for coaching and talk about your response to their dysfunction. You're not going to change their dysfunction. Okay. So here's where it's really, this is, this is unique to conquer is sometimes you get into programs where they promise you that, Hey, if you just do this, you're going to win the man of your dreams. Or if you just do this, you're going to change this other person. You are not, you are not. Jesus was perfect and he didn't change Judas. You are not going to change another person. Only the other person can do their own work. Can you hold on just a minute? This is my husband calling. I want to see if there's an emergency. Hello. I'm in my Facebook live right now. Bye. Um, only you can change you. So I would get the help that you need to describe the patterns to your, um, to your family. And so maybe their dysfunctional pattern is that they are drinking too much over Christmas, or maybe they're mean when they get under stress or whatever their pattern is. You're not going to change that. All you can do is say two things. One is, Hey, I I'm not sure, especially when you're a grown up and they're a grown up, you know, Hey, I'm really uncomfortable when I come to your house for Christmas and everybody's kind of two kites to the wind and had a couple of bottles of wine already. Um, I don't feel like we can have a healthy conversation. Um, can I either come early before all that happens or I'm not going to come at all because I'm not going to do that. So you have what you like and what's going to happen if they don't want to do what, what you like. Right. So you can't, you're not going to address their dysfunction. Now, I do think that sometimes with an elderly parent or parents that are set in their ways, I think you can say to them, mommy, I can give you some feedback. What? You know, I think you're really depressed and I'd, I'd love for you to go to a doctor for an evaluation. Or I think you're really um, drinking too much. I'd, I'd like you to consider cutting back or, you know, whatever you can, if you can say that respectfully, but you're not going to change them. You can give them some feedback or you can give them some instructions on boundaries that you're going to have, but you're not going to fix or change that. All right. I'm registered. When can I get on the live group for discussions? Well, so our first call, if you're a Conquer member, it will be on Monday. Um, so we'll be on a Zoom call on Monday, this Monday. It's every, every Monday, uh, not every Monday, the second Monday of every month and the last Monday of every month. We do one in the daytime, one in the evening. So this is the daytime call. It'll be one o'clock Eastern time, we'll have 90 minute Zoom call. I'll be doing it, answering your questions and you'll meet other Conquer sisters. So it'll require you to get into the site, get yourself um, on the page so that you can get into the phone call and you know how to do that. All right. And just email support. If you don't know how to do that, all that information is on the sales page. All right. What is the next best step? If you bring up major issues with a spouse and they deny it or endure it. If I bring it up a second time, then I'm referred to as harping or nagging or living in the past. If I don't bring it up again and they behave like I'm over it, how can we move forward? Trust is violated and I'm not over it. I think that's, that's a great question to say, I'm not sure how to go forward because I don't trust you. So I'm not sure what to do because you don't want to talk about it and I don't trust you. So where do we go from here? So instead of you trying to be this problem solver and saying, here's where we need to go. I listened to this great person on, or this person on the internet or whoever it is. And they said, you need to do this. I think you can just say, I don't know how to fix this. It's not fixed. I can be kind to you. I can be respectful to you, but our relationship isn't fixed. So where do we go from here? I think this is where we need to give someone feedback. I think we mislead people because we're kind to them and we're not talking about it. That, that means it's fixed. 
So it doesn't mean you have to be mean to them and abusive to let them know it's not fixed, but I think you can just let them know verbally, hey, I can still do your laundry and make your lunch for work if you want, but I can't kiss you or be intimate with you until this is fixed. So what do you want to do? And then maybe they're more likely to talk about it, right? So I think when you have boundaries of what you can do and what you can't do, what you will do and what you won't do, and you decide that, you don't have to say, we have to fix this. You can say, it's not fixed. It might be done on your end, but it's not done on my end. You might feel fine about this or the past of the past for you, but it's not for me. And this is really critical, ladies, especially when you're living with a narcissist. When you're living with a narcissist, they don't see you as a you. They see you as an extension of themselves. So if they feel fine, you feel fine. If they're over it, you should be over it. If they don't like something, you shouldn't like something. If they like something, you should like something. And you have no I there. You have no I, me. No, I don't like that. And so without disparaging them and saying, you're just a narcissist, I think you can say, you're a man, I'm a woman. I think differently. You like this. I don't like this. That's not who I am. That's not what I want. And you just talk about you. That's not okay with me. It might be okay with you to watch R-rated movies and with all the curse words and stuff, but I have nightmares and I don't want to watch it. It's not okay with me. So if you want to do that, that's up to you and the Lord and your conscience. So this is where we don't want to be controlling and you can't watch it either, but I'm not going to watch it. You want to, you know, you want to drink alcohol all night. That's not for me. I don't really like that. I don't want to be around you when you do that. I'm not going to do that. And then you just have your boundaries, but separate me from you. That's really important, especially when you're with a narcissist, because they won't do that at all naturally. And they'll be shocked actually when you do that. Also with someone who's on the spectrum, they don't see you as a separate person. Okay. All right, let's do a winner. The winner of the prize is Jackie Longstaff. Jackie, you are the winner for tonight's Facebook Live. And what you get for that is you get to email my assistant at Martha at LeslieBurnick.com and say, I'm Jackie and I won the Facebook prize from last night. And I want either an Amazon gift card, a Starbucks gift card, or a signed copy of one of my books. You get to pick. So no hard feelings. If you want the Amazon gift card, I want it too, because you can buy two of my books with my Amazon gift card probably. So get what you want to get. It's totally fine. And enjoy. Enjoy. All right. One more question. If your husband is going to church and a men's group, but hasn't really told anyone that we are separated and why, is there really any way that he can do his work necessary to affect the change? Well, I don't know. It depends on what his work is. So I think that that's part of what you need to have a conversation with about without trying to control him. He is a grown up. And so uh, if he has, if he needs dental work, going to church isn't going to help him get dental work, right? So I think to be able to just say to him, um, the work that I see that needs to happen for me to trust you again is not going to be done by going to church every week. I, I think it's good for you to go to church every week. And if that's what you want to do, I'm, I'm happy for that but that's not enough for me to trust you. So I'm just giving you that feedback so that, you know, if you're going because you're trying to get me to let you move back home or you're trying to show me that you're now trustworthy, that isn't enough for me to know that you're trustworthy. That might be enough for you, but it's not enough for me. So here's where you're going to speak for you. And he might think if that were him in those shoes, that would be enough for him. And this is where I think it's so important for you to stick up for yourself because some people would say, well, I, that wouldn't bother me. If, if you called me a four letter word, it wouldn't bother me. And so maybe it wouldn't bother you, but it bothers me. And because it bothers me, I don't want you to do it. Right. And so I think this is where I think we have been overly accommodating and told to be overly accommodating as Christian women. And sometimes we have never, ever told our husband this is not okay with me and I don't like it, period. It's like, oh, don't wound his ego and you're, he's too fragile for you to be smarter than him or better than him and something. So hold back and don't be yourself. And it's just garbage. It, you've got to be yourself. And I'm not saying lord it over someone or be belligerent or prideful, but if you're good at something, why would you dumb down just so he doesn't feel threatened? Why would you not be your full self, whoever God called you to be, just because that threatens your husband's ego? It's time for him to learn. That's threatening my ego. I wonder why my th ego is so threatened when she is teaching Sunday school or when she's writing a book. My, my, my husband's ego isn't threatened by that. But a lot of my friend's egos, husband's egos are. And they're squashed because he's not to be threatened. Instead of, how about he grow up? How about he develop his full self instead of squashing her from developing her full self? And we've just gotten this wrong in the church. We've, we've 
harmed people because we think that a man's feelings are the most important about everything in the world. And they're not. A woman's feelings aren't either. The glory of God is. The purposes of God are. And when we distort that uh, in our teaching and in our living, we actually harm people. It would be much more kind to say to the husband who, uh, you know, what do you think you need to do to repair broken trust, right? So if he's cheated on you and he's lied to you and he's overspent money on strip bars and porn and you're in boatloads of debt and you say to him, how's church helping you be a more honest man? And if he can't be honest enough with you to tell you that, can I, can I look at our bank account to see where we're at? Can I look at the credit cards to see where we're at? That would make me feel more comfortable if I could see actually hard facts that the money's in the account and you're not overspending that. Can I have your social security number so I can check our credit rating so I can see where we're at here? Those would be facts that would help you rebuild trust. And if he says no, then don't believe a word he says. Show me the money. Show me the proof. I want to see changes that are observable, not just that you tell me. I can't believe your words anymore. I believed your words the last time and the time before that and the time before that. I'm not believing your words anymore. And I think those are that's helpful feedback as long as you don't say it in a superior, haughty, jerk kind of way. <laughs> and that takes doing your own work because we want to say it that way, don't we? You jerk. You know, we want to we want to be snarky sometimes. I do. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> and so it takes a little bit of self-control and self-awareness that I'm not capable of saying it in a good way right now. I've got to zip my lip until I am capable of saying it the way that I want to say it. That's honorable to myself and honorable to God. And that's your work to do. So girlfriend, I am so glad you're here. We're having another Facebook Live tomorrow. My two coaches are going to be on and I'll tell you what they're going to talk about. I'm not sure, but let me see if I can find the topic. They are going to be talking about, oh, do, 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 hold on. Now, I can never find where I need to find, what I need to find, when I need to find it on my phone. Okay, so they're going to be talking tomorrow at um, 12 o'clock noon Eastern time on, on, <laughs> Kim, can you help me out? Oh, let's see. I don't know what they're talking about. Oh, why we grow stronger together. So Diana and um, Leanne are going to be talking about why it's important that you do join Conquer or some other group. It doesn't have to be Conquer. I support Conquer because I'm the leader of Conquer. There's other groups out there. All I'm saying is that you cannot do this alone. You cannot do your work all by yourself, just like your husband can't do his work all by himself. God didn't wire us that way. You don't learn all by yourself. You don't grow all by yourself. We need family. We need the church. We need the community. We need others to help us grow. If we didn't, then there would be no one another passages in there. There would be no need for church. There would be no need for family. We'd just be in little islands. And that's sort of how it's been through COVID. And we're not getting better as a culture, are we? We're getting worse. We need one another. We need feedback. And that's the purpose of this Facebook Live, is we need to give each other feedback so that we can grow into our best self. So, girlfriend, it's been so good to be here with you tonight, and I'm going to now go for that walk. I did two and a half miles so far. I've got another two and a half to go, and I am going to do that before I eat my dinner because I know me, and once I eat my dinner, I am done. I'm going to sit and relax and do my artwork, and I'm not going to do that until I take my walk because otherwise I'm not going to take my walk, and I've got to make my decision. Remember what we talked about? I make my decision out of my virtues and my values, not how I feel. Because right now I feel tired and I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. So I'm making that commitment publicly. You hold me to it, okay? So I hope to see you in Conquer. If you do want to check it out, go to the webpage where it says leslieburnick.com forward slash join Conquer. All right, take care. God bless. Bye-bye.